Um, so, Tom, thanks for that introduction. Um, as I said, this is a, a geological uh, excursion field trip uh, presentation, not a lecture. So I'm not presenting the results of my own personal research or my own career. I'm a retired oil company geologist, looked at production geology, mainly in the North Sea, China, Egypt, around the world. Um, I came to Isla about 10 years ago and decided to get stuck into all the geology that Isla can offer, which is fantastic. And as Tom pointed out, there's good stuff about Snowball Earth. There's some good stuff on the Rins. There's beautiful geology on Isla. It's a fantastic place to study geology and a great window. And there's geology for everybody. Um, I've done a few field trips and this is a, a new one. I have not actually taken people to some of these localities and two of them are in the new book uh, that I'm doing. Uh, so I'm going to do it as, a, as an excursion. So we're going to, to suspend reality and sort of uh, pretend we're actually there and try and do things in the order that you see them in the field rather than dot around and try and explain a story that you would do if you were just giving a lecture about rocks. Um, now, I'm a little bit out of my depth because this, a lot of this to, to today, tonight, is uh, igneous and metamorphic petrology, which if you're an oil company geologist, is not what you get involved in unless it's fractured. So um, apologies to experts in the EGS. Um, if you've got, I've left some references on the screens on the, some of the slides. If you're really interested in following it up, there are lots of, lots of work going on, um, especially on the metamorphics of this area. So we're going to uh, move on. I'm hoping my projector will move. Here we are. Everybody knows where Isla is. I don't need to explain this. Um, but yes, it's sort of Southern Hebrides, nearest one to Ireland, due westish of Glasgow, um, out in the out in the Atlantic, and you get to it from Kennegray on a ferry. If and I'm hoping to get there next month, but I uh, haven't been there since March, and my house hopefully is still standing. Uh, but we'll see when we get there. Well, I'm in Glasgow. I'm not in Isla at the moment. I am in Glasgow, uh, awaiting permission to to return. Okay, so here's a a wee geological map that I sort of knocked up for the book. Um, of the geology of Isla. Some of you will be familiar with a lot of this anyway. Um, so we've got, uh, I'm going to try and get my uh, uh, pointer on the laser pointer. I know it sort of delays a little bit, so I'll try and move it slowly. Um, so the previous field trips I've been doing uh, in this uh, area have been looking at the Snowball Earth stuff up around the Port Askeg area, looking at the, at the Losset limestone, the Port Askeg tillite, and the Bonahaven dolomite up there. So that's the bit I've been doing the field trips on, and I've done an introduction to Isla as well, and an introduction to Jura, and I've done one for Collinsey as well. Today, tonight, I'm going to take you down to the south end of Isla, to the south coast, and look at some of the youngest Dalradian rocks that we see on Isla, so up in the uh, the Easdale Crinan subgroup at the top, above the Jura quartzite. So we're looking at the... Uh, the sediment, the meta sediments, and the and the and the and the other rocks that are in here, and we're going to do a sort of uh, cruise along the south coast, looking at all this good stuff. Here's a typical stratigraphic column for Isla that I've knocked up. So again, you, a lot of you will be familiar with a lot of this stuff. We've got. So I'm not going to talk about the Rins or the Collinsy group tonight. Uh, subjects for more talk. I'm not even going to mention the Bonahav and Dolomite and the Port Askig Tellite. In here, we are going to start mainly talking about meta sediments in the uh, Port Island phyllite and the Lefroig quartzite formations up at the top uh, in the in our Gaia group um, and the igneous activity that goes on at that time. Yeah, so it's really this area here we're talking about. So we don't need to get lost in the stratigraphy, we don't need to worry too much about stratigraphic nomenclature or anything like that. We're going to be sticking pretty much at this sort of uh, stratigraphic level in, in the sort of uh, upper part of the Dalradian of the West Southwest Highlands. I mentioned the book. Uh, did I mention a book? Yes, there is a book. Um, I wrote this in 2015, updated it a couple of years later. Um, quite popular with the whiskey recommendations. It does sell quite well uh, on the island in the tourist outlets as well. Um, and these are the excursions I put in the first book, uh, 12 of them. And these are the excursions that are going in new volume, which was going to be launched this uh, this summer in, in the Isla Book Festival in August, but it's going to be delayed when we do it next year because I've still got to do a bit of field testing and some uh, writing up of some things. So, um, But tonight we're going to look at two excursions on the south coast. 
that are in the new book and two excursion, a bit of two excursions that are in the existing book. So it's a sort of a bit of a mix and gather them of bits and pieces of that. But these are two two excursions I really wanted to put in the book, but I need, uh, I thought I'd leave them in a, and I'm, I've got some, this is snowball earth stuff that I've done more on and then I've got six excursions on Jura and three on Collinsey for the new book. As I say, I'm not an expert. This is, this is me uh, doing, uh, uh, doing what I know and what I've seen and what I've observed. And, and I like, to me, geology, a lot of geology that I do is outreach. It's about teaching people. I take, I do an ang a mini Angus Miller when I'm there. I do a sort of, I don't call it geo walks, but I do monthly walks on Isla that we advertise through the Natural History Society there. And I like to take people out and see geology. And that's my appreciation of geology is all about landscape, the use of the rocks, how the rocks form. And, you know, it's more that interest I have rather than specific scientific interest, but I do really enjoy all aspects of geology. So, um, so where are we going to go? Here's that slide again from the uh, satellite picture. Um, these are the loca localities we're going to visit. I'm going to take you, we're going to start in Port Ellen. So imagine we're in Port Ellen, we've all driven there and we're going to take the road, a little coast road that goes out past all the distilleries uh, and keeps going, it keeps going and eventually it sort of dead ends up here at, L at Claggan Bay and we pass, we go to uh, Kildalton. So I'm going to take a little trip up there to have a look at some, uh, some nice history and archaeology uh, as a starter and then we're going to work our way back through these uh, localities uh, back into Port Ellen, uh, nick around if we get time we're going to nick round to Kilnorton. We have lunch at Ardbeg. This is all about suspending reality here now. So this is a day trip and you're going to be dipping in and out your minibus and we're going to have nice lunch at Ardbeg Distillery and we're going to finish with a dram in Port Ellen. So that's your day, okay? The easy walks, these are all little excursions that are very easily done. So I thought I'd put them in the book rather than great big yomps across to the North Coast, which is features in volume one. These are nice little uh, short things you can just nick out of your minibus or your car in to see. Yeah, okay. Okay, these, a lot of these sites um, I was made aware of by reading the, uh, the very good uh, article in the, uh, of all the Geoconservation Review series in the PGA uh, magazine. And I believe David's here tonight. One of the authors of this is sitting in the audience. So I'm a bit scared of uh, saying a load of rubbish, but I'm sure David will put me right. Um, but uh, so the five of the localities, sorry, four of the localities here are in this conservation review and it was that document that I used as a basis for this. So uh, a lot of what I'm saying is actually what uh, Jeff and Charles and David have actually said in here. So I'm uh, repeating a lot of what they've said and adding a bit more because uh, Alistair Skelton's team in Stockholm have done quite a lot of work, recent work uh, in and around the, these metamorphic sills down, in the, down here. and. Uh, which is a bit of extra stuff that isn't in in this and adds a bit of a new and extra dimension to it. So, um, okay, let's up, let's go up to the top end of the island, top end of top end of this excursion. We've driven up here, we've parked here, and I wanted to just show you. It's a good starter of this area because this is the Kildalton Cross. It's I think it's eighth century, um, and in the literature about the archaeology and history of the island, you'll notice that this is one of these so-called epidiorites. Now, it's a horrible word. I think it should be banned and excommunicated from the literature. It's a metabasalt or a metadolorite, um, Dalradian, uh, in the Dalradian succession. But these, these rocks are commonly used to be, uh, for monumental and building stones. And the Kildon Cross is, no, is a fine example of a 8th, 9th century uh, cross at Kildalton. Another point of interest while we're up here um, is that there's a little red dot I've written here, drawn here and this little bay here. Can you see this little tiny bay here? You notice that the stratigraphy is actually, the geology is actually being picked out by the topography here and there's, there's lots of uh, ridges which mainly are the epidiorite, the metabasalt uh, sills which we're going to look at in detail and the lower ground is the intervening phyllites we'll talk a bit more about in a minute this little bay is formed in one of the phyllites with the with the uh, metabasalts metadolorites on the side of it and it was one of the few sites this is a picture of the bay where german u-boats anchored during world war one um, and rustled a load of sheep and some farmers got and estate workers were quite surprised in 1916 17 to find german sailors stealing sheep from Isla. So uh, this is one of the few places where Germans actually invaded Britain during the uh, First World War. 
and it's known locally as U-Boat Bay. Aros Bay, uh, no, Glen Uig, Glass Uig is the name of the bay. Aros Bay is the big one here. This is uh, Glass Uig. So we haven't walked there. It's a bit of a boggy trek to get to, but it's a nice picture and you can take your boat in if you're a sailor. So back to some, let's, let's go and look at some geology. So here's a, a scanned uh, view of the, the BGS map. Um, and we're going to, you can see here, all the meta basalt sills and intrusions are all marked in the dark green. The, the gray colors here are the uh, Port Ellen phyllite. This yellow, not to be confused with this yellow, this is the Dura quartzite. Remember, all this is dipping southeast on the, uh, on the southeast flank of the Isla Anticline. So we're dipping southeast. You can see the dips and dip stripe uh, arrows here. They're dipping this way. This, this second yellow is the Lefroy quartzite. So we've got a sequence of Dura quartzite. Then there's a thin bit of uh, Scarborough conglomerate, Easdale slate, then the Port Ellen phyllites, which have got all the intrusions in them. The Lefroy quartzite, also stuffed full of intrusions. And then there's the Ardmore grit and conglomerate at the very top. This is the youngest Dalradian we see on Isla. Uh, you notice here we've got some, uh, there are a few tertiary dikes marked across here going in their traditional northwest uh, southeast direction. And we've got this dolerite blob here uh, in, the, in, the, in the tertiary uh, ornamentation. So we're going to, this is Ardalistri Bay, and we're going to look at this next. So our next stop is to park at the bay and have a look at the, uh, that blob, that tertiary blob. And this is Kanokaruna Stal, I can't pronounce it very well. Uh, Fairy Hill, known locally as Fairy Hill, um, and the intrusion, which is what it is, obviously a, a tertiary intrusion, sticks out quite prominently in the landscape here and extends down to the shore of the bay here. So I'm looking across the bay from the south, uh, looking pretty much north across the bay. So here's the wee geological map that I've uh, drawn uh, from, based on uh, Jeff's work in Jeff's paper. Uh, my own work and uh, and the BGS map as well. So uh, this is the area of intrusion. There's the top of the hill. Here's where we've parked. We've parked our minibus just outside Tyrone Estelle House. And we're going to look at the intrusion, three localities within the intrusion. Although you can walk up here, up here and climb through the bracken and climb top of the hill. Uh, but it's an optional extra. We're not doing it today. And then we get back to our bus, grab a cup of sandwich or something, and then we'll walk round the bay to look at this, mainly to, mainly to look at this exposure here in the, in the, in the sills of the Dalaradian. So we'll start off in the tertiary. Uh, I usually like to start at the bottom of the sequence. Uh, so this is actually gonna start at the top just to be different. Okay, so I uh, having climbed the hill, which I've done several times, uh, best done in autumn when the bracken's down. Here's the, here's the view looking south across the bay. And here's the, we're gonna see some exposures in this promontory that sticks out into the bay and then we're going to walk around the coast here and have a look at the uh, the sills on the on the south flank of the bay and these are the six localities in that i'm going to go through this is uh, uh preston um hole and still i've done a um, malcolm hole's done a huge amount of work on this intrusion and because it, it's a very unusual intrusion in the tertiary in this province as we'll see uh, he believes it's a very important place to, sh to sh show uh, differentiation. We've got an anhydrous system. We're not in a volcanic province. We don't have a lot of water kicking around. So we've got an alkali dolerite, dolerite basalt, which is the typical basalt dolerite that we see in the dikes uh, in, the, in this area. But here we have a, quite a large expanse of this dike, which is uh, differentiated. And it has some very unusual late stage uh, alkali differentiates with very unusual mineralogies. And I've simplified the geology here to show this sort of a uh, green blob, which is a, a, a leucodolerite. We're going to look at what a leucodolerite actually is. And there's a teschenite intrusion, uh, perhaps a bit younger, sitting right in the middle of it. And there's some cyanites, which we're going to have a look at uh, in a little quarry here. So we're seeing some uh, a variety of rocks from a, that aren't the normal sort of things you would see in a tertiary dike, shall we say. Yeah. And I'm indebted to all the work these guys have done. And they say, this is not my own work. This is all stolen from these guys. These guys have done all the work. I acknowledge exactly what they've done. Okay. So we, uh, this, is the, this is the way in. We're now crossing, going to go through this gate and we're going to walk down the, uh, just walked a few hundred yards from the uh, car park and we're going to walk across this lovely little field down to the coast here. And we get to the end of the promontory and we just find all this sort of, uh, 
yeah, just it's the sort of typical sort of rusty brownish sort of stuff that you expect to see you when you come across this stuff anywhere in the western southwest Hebrides, you just say, Oh, tertiary dike, tertiary dike. It's that color, it's that texture, it just screams at you, yeah. Except when you break it open, because it's very, very light colored, yeah. This is much lighter colored than you'd expect, and it's a uh, that's why it's been called a leucodolerite, a light colored dolerite. About 90% of the intrusion is this stuff, yeah. It's got olivine in it, it's an olivine dolerite, has uh, you know, normal sort of uh, labradorite sort of plagioclase and typical uh, igneous textures, ophitic. It's got you know, uh, intergrowths of, the, uh, uh, of some of the plagioclase with the augite and they've grown together again. But there is a, a, diff a sort of crystallization sequence that you can see in thin section that, that suggests the plagioclase actually crystallized first rather than the olivine and then the augite. So we actually see uh, this sort of, t this sort of um, uh, crystallization sequence and it may be that it, it, it is actually a differentiate itself from something a bit more mafic yeah um, in the chilled margin there's more olivine and there's more magnesium and you've got more forsterites on the, in the olivines so the, the chilled margins are a bit a bit more uh, and these are a bit more evolved in the main but but the 99% more than 90% of this intrusion is this look and dolerite and, and, and again, it's anhydrous, so we don't have any, a lot of zeolite, so we don't have a lot of other stuff messing around to sort of uh, mess it all up. We can actually look at some real mineralogy in this. Uh, locality two is a sort of scruffy quarry in the middle of the wooded knoll on the south flank of the, of the intrusion, and it uh, looks pretty uninspiring. Um, when you get there, you think, oh, I'm gonna find some nice stuff in. There's supposed to be some pegmatites in this area. Um, I get the, the main rock here is teschenite, uh, teschenite uh, intrusion. Uh, I have yet to find the pegmatites, and I've been there at, I've at least twice looking for them, but I'm, I'll need to go in the winter again and really have a good scruff around because they are there, and I would love to get a, a sample of the pegmatite. Um, so um, this is teschenite. It's very fine-grained. Um, it's about 10% of the intrusion. Uh, it does have a bit more hydrous mineralogy, and, and, and a lot of the plagioclase is sort of converted to an alcime. Loss, it's less olivine than the, the main intrusion has some biotite amphibol, um, and, it, and it's likely that the crystallization was synchronous. We don't get these sort of other textures. And then now, so we've got a slight later, it's possibly a slightly later intrusion into the middle of the, of the stock and uh, with a bit more water in it. Um, that's a fresh surface of it. So it's a bit darker as well, um, because I think it's just the fine grain nature of it tends to make it a little bit more darker than the, Luca, than the, uh, the Luca diorite, dolerite that it's surrounded by. So it's teschenite because it's got an alcite in it, or is it? I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but uh, do you, is, is an alcime the, the correct word or an alcite? I don't know. I, I tend to think an alcime tends to be more used these days, but I guess someone will put me right. Um, we go leave that exposure because I want to take you into locality three, which is a scruffy quarry on the north side. There's the gate that we came through. This is an older picture. The wall had fallen down because someone crashed into it. Uh, one problem with a, a whiskey island, you go a bit of drink driving, and I think this is what happened here. Anyway, it's been repaired now. Um, but you go back here and you go back into this little quarry here. Uh, it's typical uh, geology of old quarries. It's uh, a barbed wire fence to start with, and then a load of bracken. Um, better, better in the winter. This is an autumn picture, but it's one of these sort of typical quarries that geologists you either love or hate. Um, you get in there, and eventually you'll find this light colored sort of rock with a bit of a sort of striation foliation in it. Um, yeah. Um, and this is what a quarry that, that these guys explored, that, that Malcolm Hole and his colleagues all explored and had a good look at. And it's a Nepheline cyanite. When you take a sample of it, it's actually got all these little needles in it. And uh, I've, got a, I've got a thin section of it just coming up, but mainly this rock is quite, uh, is, is, an, is an albite, Plagioclase, so we've lost the calcium. It's very analcized, um, analcimized, uh, has, case, has potassium feldspar and some nepheline, and um, these five millimeter needles of, uh, of high titanium uh, chiasutite, um, which is an amphibol. Um, there's no olivine in it, has some pyroxene, and what's unusual is it has an agerine in it that is very high in zirconium, unusual and a calcium zirconium silicate that's incredibly rare, um, calcium catapleate. So there's uh, some very straight, and there's a, Malcolm's written a whole paper on these strange zirconium silicates in this intrusion. Yeah? 
uh, if Angus can look at the chat and if it's a question for me that I can answer, you can, uh, or we can take it at the end. No, someone got a question? And I saw a chat come up there, yeah? yeah Angus, you're on mute, so I can't hear what you're saying. So, sorry, yeah, it's just clarification from David Stevenson about Anosim. Okay, and Elsim, yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so this is a very small in part of the intrusion. It's, um, it's a very small area, but then the exposure is not brilliant. It's covered a lot of bracken, so there could be more of this, these uh, so-called nests. And they're, they're called nests in the literature here. Uh, the sort of little uh, localized trapping of these sort of uh, highly evolved fluids at the very end of the crystallization. And we got, and the, the literature describes nests, which are little sort of uh, pods, I suppose. And then you get the schleren, which are the sort of, uh, where you get sort of more, more streaks of, uh, sort of diffuse streaks of the stuff of these fluids which are not meteoric and deuteric it's the as as in, in the literature at the time it may be that that things have moved on a bit uh, it's supposed to be the only known occurrence of this zirconia major in, in the british tertiary igneous province and only the second report of this cata, rare cataplegiate in the literature and there's a, a later paper they've written which has got which looks at some very very sort of unusual high rare earth enrichments in the, in the floor appetites that are in this and minor appetite in this intrusion as well. And they say it's the highest they've ever seen. So a lovely little rock with a lot of things going on in. I did take, I did steal a couple of thin section photographs from their papers. So just to show you the, uh, the, uh, the, the amphibole, the Teutonium amphibole, which is actually reacting to our fedsonite. So you've got an amphibole here changing with the, and this is the, so this is the little black needles that you saw in my hand specimen. Uh, in thin section here. There's the NL seam, correctly written. And I am keep crediting uh, Malcolm Hole and his colleagues for some of this work. This is not my picture. And I think I've got a picture here and a, an SEM uh, backscattered thing showing the agerine, the zirconium age, and the, and the cataplegiate. Uh, so we're talking about very small. And we're not talking about nice hand specimens you can display on your mantelpiece here. We're talking about tiny, tiny, tiny uh, bits of mineralogy here, yeah? So an interesting place. I mean, it's a bit scruffy to get into, but you can go and it has been a bit collected a bit as well. People have picked bits out of this thing and it's quite friable and rubbly in there as well. But it's an interesting little, uh, these cyanite nests are certainly an interesting to igneous petrologists. This is good stuff. Yeah? Um, the, the, the whole intrusion looks like it's probably that I drew this little picture to, sort of in the book. So the difference between the sort of a uh, dike and sill uh, ge ge geology you would get, a dike that maybe reaches the surface as a fissure volcano that's maybe happening in a few dikes that we see uh, on Isla and elsewhere. And then maybe some of the, this is, this is described as a distended head of a dike that perhaps never reached the surface. There's certainly evidence on the summit of the thing that the joint patterns are sort of a sort of crescentic at the top. And it may be that the current erosion level is not far off the top of the stock or the boss. Um, so we've got, uh, so it generally it probably had this small magma chamber there that allowed some time to cool and, and allow the differentiation to come rather than, rather than just go shooting up the surface and erupting. So we've got time for the thing to, uh, to generate its, uh, its differentiates. And I say the current erosion level is not far below the top of the intrusion based on what we see on the summit. And uh, probably the leucodorite formed first, then the teshnite maybe slightly later, and the cyanite is the last sort of stage of it. And probably we've got olivine and plagioclase crystallizing out that then enriches the, uh, the remaining liquids in the, in the felsic component. So it's a, a nice sort of example of a differentiated uh, igneous body. Um, and it probably hasn't much interaction with the country rock. It's just come straight up. Yeah. So a nice little intrusion. Um, lovely if you, if you like these sorts of things. Um, and it doesn't have a lot of, apart from the little bit of an L seam that we're seeing in it, the whole thing looks quite dry. It's not got a lot of hydrothermal activity going on. So it's, it's quite a nice example of a sort of dry, sort of intrusive complex. So that's where we were. We were, uh, we were a little quarry, the teshinites in here, that little scruffy quarry with the cyanites in here. There's the summit of the hill. Uh, we parked our van here, our minibus is here, and we're going to come back there. We grab the sandwich and we're going to walk through the woods, cross over this little burn on the beach here, and look at these, uh, some sills here. You can see here the topography, you know what we're talking about already. We've got some weather, weather, weather some topography. We're seeing uh, igneous, igneous sills in the Dalaradian. Yeah. So we're gonna walk across the beach here. Oh, there's the map, yeah, just put the map in again. So we're now, we've seen one, two, three, we're gonna go to four, five, six uh, uh, for our little trip along the edge of the bay. So here's the, there's the top of the hill. 
and as we've just walked across through the woods here, um, there's actually a, a tertiary Phenozoic Paleocene dike running through across the beach in its normal orientation. I don't know whether this is younger or older than the, the actual sill, the, than, the, than the stock, um, but there's certainly a, uh, a typical normal sort of uh, dike, uh, northeast, northwest, southeast dike running across the beach here. And at right angles to it, there's another one, which it comes at right angles, and it's got a lot of beautiful sort of seroidal uh, onion skin weathering in it. And it's right and bang next to one of these uh, Dalradian metabasite uh, sills, which is here. Yeah, um, and it, you can see that. So the, 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 this is running. This is this is striking uh, north, east, south. Get it right. North, east, southwest. And this dike is also north, east, southwest. But the one on the beach is the other way. So there's a sort of like an aphesis of of, of the dike of the tertiary dike sticking out here, and it's quite beautifully sphroidal weathered. And that's the dike actually in here. You can just see it sort of different angle on it there running here. And then you get this, this is the sill. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is meta sediment and this is meta igneous. And you'd be wrong because a lot of this schistos stuff with the foliation at the base of these sills is actually still the sill. And we're going to have to spend a bit of time this evening uh, talking about the, uh, the reasons for the schistosity development at the base of these sills and at the top. And how all this this uh, works, but this is when you look at this in detail, you see a lot of um, little relic uh, pseudomorphed plagic plagioclase uh, phenocris in this. Um, so it's not it's not a meta sediment. It's a it's a it's a meta igneous rock. And on the top of it, if you go around the corner, this is the second actually the second uh, of the two sills we just see just here. There's the, that's actually the sill. It's foliated at the top, and then it goes into a meta sediment here, which is actually a meta sandstone at the top. So the foliation is uh, is quite is is uh, developed at the base of the sill and at the top. Remember, these sills are all dipping; they're concordant with bedding, and they're all dipping in southeast on the southeast flank of the Isla Anticline. So we're structurally quite simple. We've got a thirty to forty, fifty degree sort of a southeast dip on all the geology here, and these sills are concordant with the bedding. Um, and in fact, the uh, and many of the sills have got a foliated top and base. Um, and this is a sort of diagram that, that comes from a lot of the work that Alistair Skelton and his team from Stockholm have been doing, uh, started off by Colin Graham in the 80s and 90s, and they've developed a lot of work since there. Um, they see that the centre of the sill is unaltered, yeah, and it's a typical green schist, what you would get if you took a calcium plagioclase, pyroxene, uh, typical uh, uh, dolerytic composition uh, sill, and, uh, and metamorphosed it in green schist facies, you would get uh, the, med the, the calcium plagioclase would become sodium plagioclase and you get the development of epidote and amphibole and some chlorite, which is why it's green. You've got a lot of epidote and a lot of chlorite and some green amphibole. So the center of these cells is unaltered green schist metabasite. The uh, intermediate assemblage is this sort of what's called B here, where you start to see calcite replacing amphibole and epidote. And in the edges of the sill, and I've drawn this uh, with a sort of a asymmetry on it, with a sort of thin, sh uh, thin sh uh, schistose top and a thicker schistose base, like just the one we've just walked past. And uh, these these things here have uh, in, in virtually entirely made up of calcite, quartz, and chloride. Yeah, so they've been, and the, the, the term that Alistair and Co. use is carbonated. So they've been carbon, they're not, they've been turned into a, a carbonate, basically. Yeah, uh, and, the, and a lot of the plagioclase phenocris have been, pseudomorphed by calcite or, uh, and or chlorite and quartz. Um, uh, his view is that the, 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 the fluids coming out of the meta mudstones are invading the sill. Um, and if the sill is tilted, so if some of these fluids are sort of post-deformation or slightly post-deformation, the sill is inclined and the fluids rising vertically will affect the bottom of the sill more than the top of the sill and infiltrate into it. And we're gonna talk about, we're gonna show to this afternoon in our walk this afternoon after lunch, a few more examples of these sills, and we'll as we go through uh, the talk and, and we go as we go through some of these exposures, we'll develop the story. So I'm not going to tell you all the story now because there's a lot to the story, but I want you to grasp for those who don't have not seen these before, and many of you have seen them, and I'm perhaps talking to uh, there's a granny taking you to suck eggs, but nevertheless, this is this is this is the standard sort of picture of the defamation history of uh, one of these uh, epidiorite, ep I won't call it epidiorite, 
uh, metabasite seals. It does require influx of carbon dioxide and water. So we need hot, hot carbonate, uh, carbon rich fluids to do this. Like most metamorphism, it doesn't really progress unless you've got some fluid. Metamorphic fluids are the sort of key to metamorphism. Dry systems don't metamorphose very much, um, but, uh, but certainly uh, with a lot of fluid kicking around, especially when you've got a lot of wet metamudstone in between all these sills, uh, uh, there's a lot of water. And a lot of these metamudstones are quite organic rich, a lot of graphite, well, now a lot of graphite in them, are quite dark, and a lot of the carbon uh, may have come from uh, decaying organic matter. So we've got organic rich mudstones dewatering at 400 degrees centigrade um, and being deformed. So there's a lot of water and a lot of carbon dioxide kicking around that, uh, that can flow into these uh, sills and cause the... Uh, Alistair, at this time, I'm going to talk about how it relates to the deformational history and how it all ties in. So uh, we'll hold you wished for a little bit on that, because at the time, a lot of these diagrams were drawn, a lot of the papers that Alistair and co wrote in the, in the, uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s were, were talking about it being sin deformational and outlasting deformation. There's a view now that a lot of this metamorphic, metamorphic fluid flow is actually post entirely post deformation. And that's an interesting thing we will talk about as we develop and go and see some more exposures. But I'll leave you with that at the moment because that's the sort of standard picture of these sills. Um, well, before I leave it, I just wanted to show you a picture of poached from Alistair of, a, of an amphibole in, a, in one of these uh, transitional lithologies, mineralogies, where the amphibole is, in, is, is being, so this is relict amphibole here in the brown and the whole, amphib the whole crystal is being replaced by calcite. Yeah? And the basic reaction that goes on here is that with, with amphibole and epidote, with carbon dioxide and water, you generate this uh, secondary assemblage of chloride, calcite, and quartz. So you've got a metamorphic assemblage being re-metamorphosed, as it were, by fluids. So you've got creation of amphibole, an epidote, and, and albite from the original pyroxene calcium plagioclase assemblage in the, in the, de in the igneous sill to uh, on the edges of the sill to a schistose chloride calcite quartz assemblage. Um, so back to metasediments, we walk along the bay. This is the Lefroy quartzite, probably a shallow marine sand, so not a lot of features in it, a little bit of cross bedding, um, but not a lot of geology going on in, in the Lefroy quartzite. It's not actually very well exposed either. There are just some scruffy exposures as you walk around the bay because the headlands of the bays are all the, the meta igneous rocks and the, uh, the meta sediments tend to be quite, quite poorly exposed here and it's not the main focus of the day is, anyway. So we, uh, we come around the bay, another little sill here not very well exposed and the one I wanted to take to you is this big sill that sort of bounds the southern portion of the bay um, here and this is I've come around the corner here, I've paddled around the corner here to look at the, the uh, sort of quite a big exposure of the sill uh, just around the corner here and there's a fault running through here and there's an offset uh, here it's probably a mesozoic or even a tertiary fault offsetting the uh, the, uh, the the sill. What's in, what's interesting about this sill is that it's uh, been described as uh, a cumulate. We have there's a picture of the sill here. It's quite difficult to see everything because a lot of fallen blocks. But uh, what you can observe is relict igneous uh, cumulate history here of a uh, of an accumulate at the bottom, which was probably originally pyroxene at the base, settling out with leaving a plagioclase-rich liquid here and a metabasite with phenocrysts at the top and then a schistos top and a schistos bottom. So rather than just having schistosity with this thing in the middle, we've got an extra dimension to this still that we've got differentiation going on, cumulative settling going on here. And the metapyroxenite is now obviously been metamorphosed to an amphibole. So it's actually a arguably a hornblendite but I would because it's good to show the um, the protolith in the in the description of the rocks and metapyroxenite is um, a good ex a good a good uh, term for it yeah here's a picture of a bit of a hand specimen of it it's sort of a you can see some nice crystals in it with your hand lens a lot of amphibole act mainly actinolite uh, and uh, it's stuffed full of it so this is this is about 80 percent uh, now 80 percent amphibole then we get this uh, metanorthosite with great big plagioclase phenocrysts in it. Huge things. You know, these, these are, there's a scale here. These are centimeter sized uh, things that jump out at you. Um, and again, this is probably 70% uh, 
plagioclase. It is now albite, albatized, because of the green schist metamorphism, but an anorthosite would have been in what it would have been an anorthite at the time, so we have a meta anorthosite here. Um, and then at the top, we've got pretty much the standard sort of thing here. This is pretty standard, a sort of metabasite with some plagioclase phenocrysts in it. So this is the standard sort of thing. Certainly Jeff in, and, and David in their, in their paper described this as perhaps the only green schist fasces metapyroxenite in the British Isles. So that's uh, a nice unusual rock for you to, to sort of think about. There are not many of these about. They, these sills are usually quite thin and uh, don't usually differentiate this well and, and don't settle out this well. They just intrude and freeze and you get, and we're going to talk a bit about spinatization and other outcrop because there is uh, an examples of that, some more alteration products going on. But this is fairly unusual that you actually get enough time. This is obviously a thick sill. This is 12, 13 meters thick. This is quite a big, a big igneous body. And it obviously has a, an op, an op, had an opportunity here to do some uh, crystal settling. So a nice place to go and look at some nice uh, unusual rocks. Um, let's move on. Right, we've jumped, we're going to go back to the van, minibus, and we're going to jump in the car and we're going to just quickly, quickly have a nip into Ardbeg. We're probably going to nip in there and have our lunch at the old Kiln Cafe, or at least get a coffee there. It's a lovely place to get uh, one of the best cafe restaurants in Isla when it's open um, at the Ardbeg Distillery. And here's a geology, here's the geological map. Uh, again, we're in the Lefroy Quartzite Formation and there's, and again, sills here. Now, I'm not going to dwell on it too long, but the top of this sill here, in a, there's a little fold in, in this sill here. The very top of it is uh, a sort of uh, sort of brownish metabasite or a rock. And uh, certainly Jeff and co have looked at this and found little radiating crystals of stiltnomalane, which is unusual. And it's maybe because this sill is quite high in iron and this is fairly rare mineral to find. And this is small. I mean, I haven't put the scale on that, but these are millimeter sized blades of stopnomalane, which is an iron rich sheet silicate, but it is the biotite. But it's, it shows to get this, you need a lot of iron in the system. So there's a lot of, uh, this is a metabasite with a lot of iron in it. And it just shows you that mineralogy, original igneous mineralogy can affect, greatly affect what metamorphic minerals you develop. It's a bit uninspiring when you get to it on the cell. I've examined these rocks carefully with my hand lens and I've yet to find the, the damn stuff, which is why I've shown and picked, that's why I've stolen uh, Jeff's picture here because I can't find the damn stuff or certainly can't convince myself I can find it. But uh, maybe go back next summer, next this autumn and have another good look for it because it, I'm sure it's there and I'm sure it's, uh, it's worth trying to find a hand specimen of it. But an unusual rock and it's worth you know, and it's only just five minutes walk from the from the cafe just here, so it's uh, you know, it'd be interesting to take us with a nice little uh, little lunch break at Ardbeg. So we'll move on down the coast from Ardbeg Distillery to another one that you've all heard of. This is uh, this is Lagavulin, a big distillery on Isla, uh, run by Diageo, and we're gonna. This is Lagavulin Bay here, and Texas Island off to the, off on the south coast here. Um, so the, the Lagavulin Bay distillery sits in the in the in the main the bay, and the, and it's around. It's a lovely little bay, and it's got two big headlands, uh, which have both got uh, archaeological uh, and historical sites guarding the bay. So this was probably a very important uh, place. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Dunyvade Castle uh, for those who are interested in history and archaeology, and and also the, the headland on the other side, which has got a big dune on it. So a good little place to come here. We've parked. Uh, We've parked over here by the distillery and we've 10 minute, five minute walk down, down to here. We can look at the geology on this side of the, of the, of the bay and then we're gonna go back to the distillery, uh, to the car and then walk to the other side of the bay. So we've got two little short walks uh, around the both sides of the bay. And yes, I've got a geological map that I've uh, concocted. Um, so here's the distillery. We've parked here at the distillery. Uh, hasn't got a nice cafe this time, but uh, you can go in the shop and buy yourself a nice bottle. Uh, 16 year old is quite nice. Um, you can walk down here and we will look at a few little, you can see here from the, the ornamentation that the, the light colored rocks here, this is the Lefroy Quartzite. Um, and again, it's in low ground, yeah? It's low ground and the higher ground of, the, of where these uh, that guard the bay are the, are the, uh, the Metabasite sill yet again. And you can see there's quite an unusual geometry of these sills here. And they seem to stop and start. Um, one seems to trend along the north side of the bay. 
and the bay is obviously formed in the softer uh, metasediments of the uh, of the, the Freud quartzite, and the and the, and the the bay is guarded by these uh, these harder, tougher rocks. So we'll look down at uh, um, kind of a quick look down here. Um, quick, this is just a quick thing here, and we'll look at Dunnevade Castle, and then we'll nick back and again have a look at uh, some stuff over here that Jeff's picked out. For so locality one just here is a is a big metabasite sill and the, right down the middle of the bay there's a lovely little tertiary dike sticking up so it's just a nice place to come and see two igneous intrusions similar uh, the side by side yeah what's interesting is that the um and you'll, this is a theme about this whole locality is the metabasite sills are intruding us a, a meta sandstone sequence entirely meta sandstone sequence and uh sequence, and there's very little schistosity in this dike, in the, sorry, in this sill. Um, and there's also a, a fault here along the coast, which I'm going to show you a bit more of as well. So I just took you here just to show you this. It's just a, a nice example of it. And further along, there's another igneous uh, tertiary Paleocene dike sticking out into the sea, uh, quite a prominent thing. I'm going to show you a Google Earth shot of this in a minute. And there's Dunnevade Castle uh, also sitting on the, so this is the, this is the meta basite sill running in this direction here and then across the other side of the bay. And then at right angles to it is the, uh, the tertiary uh, dike. And you can see here's the meta basite and here's the sandstone and there's no schistosity in this. Um, there's some cross bedding and stuff in the sandstone, uh, but no schistosity developed because this is probably doesn't have all that water and carbon dioxide in it that the meta mudstone has. The meta mudstone is sourcing the fluids. This stuff is just quartzite. And it doesn't have a lot of the fluids that, that involve that, that are going to help metamorphose this sills. This is just straight green schist pressure dominated metamorphism of the, of, of, uh, of, 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 the, of the original dolerite. Um, this is this fault that runs along the coast. It's quite interesting. You get these gullies running along the coast. This is in the meta base site. This is the meta base site itself, and you get this fault running right down the, the side of the thing. And this is trending north, east, southwest. And here's an aerial shot of it. So we're there's our locality one with our dike still in the middle of the bay. The, the uh, meta bay site is this stuff here, running down here. And there's this. And what you can see is there's a slight offset on this. This is the coastal fault here. Yeah, right. Quite prominent on the aerial photography, and it sort of slightly offsets the. Uh, there's the fault, and there's the sill, the dike. It sort of offsets slightly. So there's obviously some sort of. Uh, there's a sort of dextral shift on this sort of thing. Um, and it's quite, quite a lot of these faults around Isla have uh, offset tertiary dikes. I showed it in some of the other field trips that I've been doing, and I'm quite interested in it. And I know there is quite a lot of work being done on some of this stuff offshore as well, where there is a, a sort of pattern of, uh, orthogonal pattern of faults of this, this and at right angles of this with dextral and sinistral offsets that are, that are almost certainly related to the, up, to the, uh, to the uh, thermal updoming of the uh, of the tertiary igneous province, and all, and also interaction with the alpine compression. So there's a, uh, you know there's geology going on. It's not just dike intrusion. Other things are happening. So we'll move on a little bit. We'll just have a quick look at uh, three. This is uh, just moving around to look at Dunnevade Castle, but this is the dike. Uh, sorry, the sill again sitting on top of this thick sequence of mainly uh, sandstone, meta sandstones. And looking the other way from that viewpoint is the castle itself, which is sitting on this uh, lovely little intrusion here. And uh, the base of the intrusion can be seen here. Um, Dunnevade Castle is very interesting. It's been uh, taken, out, taken over. It being, uh, this is probably a picture of an artist's impression of what it may have looked like in the, in the 14th century. Probably has an earlier history than that, maybe 12th or 13th century. Certainly was, it became a Campbell stronghold and uh, is one of the, it's being excavated um, it would have been excavated as we speak by Isla Heritage, which is a, a, a charity formed by Reading University Archaeology Department under under Steve Mython, Dr. Steve Mython, Professor Steve Mython, who's uh, an Isla file like me, has a house on Isla, and uh, but takes a lot of uh, archaeology students to uh, to Isla, and uh, he's a Mesolithic expert, but he's got involved with with because uh, uh, Lefroy, sorry Lagavulin, have thrown a lot of money at. Uh, this and they're going to develop a, a visitor center and things. And I meant to show you a picture of a Campbell seal, uh, the seal on a that would use for the official officials, which is one of the key finds they found last year in the excavation. So it's worth going there to see that. Every time I go there, 
Steve and his team have done more excavation and it will become quite a site, when I say site, quite a site uh, to visit in Isla in the in coming years when the ex, 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 he's, uh, he's got 10 year excavation program and, and uh, Diageo have promised loads of money to develop a, a, a sort of visitor center there. So this little peninsula may become quite interesting in uh, a pl good place to visit in, in the future. We have a nice cafe. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that, there's Danny Bake. And that's when we're gonna walk back, back down past our car. We're gonna walk down here. If it's raining, we'll drive the cars and just park down here near the boatyard. This is Gus McPherson's boatyard. Um, now you read the literature that uh, Jeff in Jeff's paper, and he talks about Cernag Farm. This is now not Cernag Farm anymore. This is uh, Gus McPherson's uh, Isla Sea Adventures boatyard. Uh, it's now uh, a litter of boats, old and new. And um, we're going to have a quick look at some uh, some lovely uh, stuff down here, and then quickly look at the the headland here to finish off this part of the excursion. So here we are looking down at this little bay just out, this is from the headland here, and we're gonna look down here. And again, we've got a whole sequence of sort of bedded sandstones and, and the mudstones, uh, um, some lovely uh, differentiation between bedding and cleavage. You could demonstrate to uh, novice geologists that there's a difference between bedding and cleavage, meta mudstone, meta sandstone, and there's some little dikelets as well, little sandstone dikes that, that, that poke down into some, some of the sands, poke down into the other sands. And the key feature in this locality is this, which is a huge, long, and folded sandstone dike. Yeah, it sort of trends down here, goes here, 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 and it probably goes about 16 meters, or maybe 20 meters down into the underlying meta mudstone sequence. This, and it's folded. You can see this beautiful fold here, and a lot of this cleavage in here is actual planar to it, so that we've got. So there's a big debate in my own mind is about how much of this tortuosity of this dike was original sedimentary and how much it has been enhanced or modified by the deformation. Remember, you're in a, a thick mudstone unit here. This is maybe a 20, 30 meter mudstone, uh, mudstone dominated unit here above below these sandstones. And uh, so this would have been deformed plastic. It would have been a, a sort of soggy mess, whereas these more competent sands would have sat there. So these would have folded and taken on the, the cleavage of the main Isla anticline, which is up to our right hand side, which is dipping to the southeast again. So there's folding going on here, and this S1 is probably axial, this is a, a S1 axial planar cleavage to these folds. So there's certainly a tectonic element to the folding of this dike, but I suspect it was pretty sinuous to start with, and a lot of the tectonics have enhanced original deposition or feature. I drew a little picture of this, which is going to stick in the book to show you what these, the, maybe that these sands were sort of maybe isolated a little bit, little pods of sand. You'd bury them and you maybe overpressure them a bit. This is what happens in oilfield geology. Anyway, these things get overpressured. Then you have some sort of earthquake and you generate uh, uh, injection of dikes. Uh, debate in my own mind as to whether they go up or down or both. I think they probably do a bit of both. I know the ones that Roger and that showed me at Napdale seem to have gone up. Uh, this one looks like it's certainly this sort of one that's gone down, yeah, um, from its from its mother bed, yeah. But uh, I guess that all things can happen depending on hydrostatic pressures and fluidization pr pressures and depth of burial and length of earthquake shaking. Earthquake shaking seems to be something that that generates these things. It seems to be what the the, the trigger that uh, that that these things uh, take on. But uh, yeah, lovely a lovely example. There are other, other examples in the, in the in this part of the in the in the Craignish Philite, Adrashig, Adrashig Philite on the mainland as well, but in the Napdale area. But this is a lovely example on Isla of a of a sandstone dike. We also have another dike here, but this is not a tertiary dike. This is actually a metabasite dike with the same mineralogy as the green schist fasces uh, dikes sills that we saw but it is a dike, it's subvertical, trends north-south. And it's very interesting, why is that here and what is it doing? Um, why, we've seen lots of sills and this is a dike, so is, in, and the sort of interpretation is that maybe some of these dikes are feeders to the sill complex. So I'll let it hang there because I'm gonna show you another example of this in the next exposure and then we can have a quick discussion about it. So I climb onto the hill overlooking Gus's boatyard is down in here, there's the distillery, there's Dunny Vega, I'm on top of the hill here yeah this is actually a dune 
uh, not much left of it anymore. I think I've got a picture of my wife standing next to what's left of a bit of walling. Uh, this is uh, Iron Age or about 0 BC, BCE sort of time dune walling. So this is a couple of thousand years old wall, still there. A lot of it's there because it hasn't been cannibalized for building, but it's still there. Um, but when you look down from that, you see this is the, this is the metabasite sill. It's quite a thick, great big sort of chunk of the, of the, of the metabasite here, but it's got this another one of these dikes. So I'm looking pretty much along strike here of the, of the sill. And this dike's running about north-south, like the other one. And it's certainly an interpretation that these are feeders to the sill system, yeah, because they have the same mineralogy. So I drew a little sketch in the same vein as I do the uh, drew the uh, the sandstone dikes. I thought I'd draw a, a dike and a sill. A nice simple geology. Uh, up it comes. Maybe that it, it spreads out because of the balance of the pressure, the hydrostatic and lithostatic pressures balance, and the thing won't go any higher and just spreads out. Uh, I say I'm not an igneous petrologist. I don't, but but what I see that seems to match that explanation seems to match what I see. So I so I go with it. Yeah. Um, then it looks quite a good explanation. And then you bury more sediment because these things are probably being intruded into wet sediments pretty much synchronously with the deposition. Yeah, so this, this is being deposited. So more deposits come on top. Another pulse of magma comes up, breaks through, and then sets it. Then it's, it, it then spreads out as a sill and it's slightly younger. So one is older, two is younger and spreads out. And dike, the dike that fed two cuts through sill one. So that, to me, it tries to explain a little bit about the sort of uh, field relations that we're seeing down on the foreshore, that we've got a dike cutting through um, the, uh, the metasediments. It also cuts through a, an older a dike. So this, this dike is younger than that sill that it cut through in that last exposure. So I thought that was a nice little, a nice little story. And if you go to the north end of Jura, I just throw this in because a lot of the sills that we see in the on Isla and southern Jura are replaced in northern Jura with these dikes. So there's, whether, whether, there are only two that I know of on Isla, but the whole of northern Jura and Scarba is full of these north-south trending uh, dikes, which are all these metabasalts. And originally, the original survey in 1907, but none other character than Ben Peach himself, said that these were post-metamorphic. They were post the folding, so that they are vertical, Therefore, they cut the dip. This is, these are these quartzites and the scarp agglomerate is all dipping 30 or 40 degrees southeast, and these are vertical, and they cut through. So they, they interpreted at the time and saying, okay, so you've got Greenschist Fatty's metamorphism and then intru intrusion of these of the sills, and then you've got intrusion of dikes and another phase of metamorphism. Um, now, uh, Graham Borrowdale and Colin Graham in the, eight, in the 80s and 90s did some research on these and believe that they are the same age as the things, as the sills, the dikes are the same age, so that feeder system, and it's believed that these are probably are feeders to the Tabalic volcanics, which obviously stratigraphically younger, it's on top, they've cut through the system, but they believe that uh, the tension was in a sort of southwest northeast direction, so the extension so we now see dip to the southeast, but the extension direction was in right angles to that. And that effect, that is actually reflected in some of these faults. So if you actually unfold this stuff and take the southeast dip out of it, you actually get a, an extension direction in this way. So that the Daradian Basin, which we tend to think of something that was sort of deepening and thickening to the southeast, is actually in this area. And it backed up by some of Roger Anderton's work on the Scarborough conglomerate, which he sees currents flowing to the north and the northeast that, that, that basically we had some sort of a basin developing to the north to the north with intrusion of the dikes which have been rotated around because of the uh, of the of this later structural dip so that ben peach was, was wrong in the 1907 but we'll give, forgive him for that and uh, but this is a sort of explanation that seems to fit and suggest that maybe and maybe some of these faults were were active at the time of deposition controlling the basin and were intruded by dikes in, in certainly when I mean, the Tabalic volcanic is, is slightly younger than the Jura slate, Jura conglomerate stuff. So these are dikes that have come up through and have fed the Tabalic volcanics to the north. I say that here because it's just a nice example of, but it just shows you that the dikes down the south of Isla are related to these and they are feeders to volcanic sequences that are stratigraphically younger. I just thought I'd throw that in because it was quite a nice little thing. 
how are we doing for time? Nearly, we're nearly there. Um, we're going to couple. Of, we're going to just nip back into Port Ellen uh, to finish off. We're going to there's Port Ellen. There's the ferry coming in. You can see these uh, dikes sticking the silt. Sorry, the metabase is still sticking out. Cause great grief to the Calmac ferry. They hate coming into Port Ellen. It's a horrible place to turn a ferry into because it's got all these uh, geological scaries running out to sea, and you have to come. You have to come right round in a great big bend to get into into Port Ellen because of the geology. Um, here's my map of Port Ellen, um, and we're going to take you to uh, just a quick, very quick trip. We're going to park here and just walk 100 yards or so to a, to a little exposure here, uh, which I know, which I call Alistair's Bay. This is Alistair Skelton's prime place. He takes all his Swedish students to uh, to show them Meta Bay site sill. So here's pretty much the geography of uh, of, the, of this. It's again, you can tell that these are the these are the this is the dip. The dips to the southeast. These are the sills. This is the Port Ellen Philite in the, in, in the low ground. And that's Lefroig Distillery, which we hadn't visited yet. We've driven past it, but that's Lefroig Distillery in the background there. Here's a geological map. We've parked here. We've walked through here, up through here, past the old Coast Guard station, crossed through here, and we're down here uh, enjoying a wee snack down here. And we see this, which is uh, one of, a lovely, clean example of the foliated sill that I showed you right at the very beginning. After we'd finished our igneous intrusion, we saw a foliated sill. This is, because it's swept by the sea here, it's quite a clean exposure here. And Alistair always asks his students to put their finger or their hammer on the base of the sill, which is metasediment and which is metaigneous. The, the, the trick question here is the hammer's in the wrong place. Yeah? That is where most people would stick it. Yeah, but in fact, it's here. Yeah, all of this stuff. This is metasediment up here to here. Yeah, and this stuff is metaigneous schistose base of a sill, and then this is slightly altered. This is and the alteration decreases, increases and up here. It's the sort of clean core of the unaltered metabasite. So uh, the hammer's in the wrong place, just to fool everybody. But Alistair always puts the hammer there, and then asks the geologist, the students to. Uh, to tell him whether, whether he's right or wrong. And there's uh, an interpretation of the metasediments, metaigneous, schistose, and metabasite. And this stuff in here, he calls it carbonated because you can see here, we got the, all the calcite is often roded out. Yeah, so we get pockets of weathered out calcite. So it looks quite, it looks carbonate. It looks like a, an eroded carbonate. And it is, it's, it's, a, it's a very, Cal calcareous uh, uh, rock. So here's the sort of uh, geology that I've used. I've, I'm just I'm now just going over the same stuff now, but uh, original silvers, pyroxene, pals and planted clays, green schist metamorphism. You get no calcite in the middle, but lots of and and, and all the, at margins, all the amphibole is gone, and uh, so you just get this schistose alteration at the base of the sill. Now. What's interesting in this sill is that we get these great big plagioclase phenocris, and some of them are quite zoned. You can see this is even in hand specimen. You can see the zonation in here, and it's actually albitic, and it's more calcic in the middle, showing that this probably this calcic core hasn't been affected. And also, we get a lot of epidote veins or patches or segregations. You can see here this is one here on the in, in the foreshore here. The uh, the volume change in epidote formation in this aggregation gives a sort of pseudo cleavage because its volume is a volumetric change in here. But you get this green, these sort of pistachio green uh, patches and veins. You can see, and you get this cleavage. So it shows it looks like sort of stitch lines. You can see there's a lot of a lot of these segregation, what they call segregations of epidote at the top of this particular sill. Uh, just around the corner from Alistair's sill. And here's a close-up of uh, one of these uh, epidote veins. You can see the cleavage, pseudo-cleavage in, in this thing here, this sort of volume change uh, thing here. There's the plagioclase uh, phenocris base, the thing, and here's the epidote thing. There's the epidote, it's almost entirely epidote uh, in this thing here. And it's been, Alistair's view is that this has been spilletized. This has reacted with uh, seawater. Sodium's come through this thing. And the calcium has come out of the plagioclase into the, and form the epidote. So there's been an exchange with seawater. So this is uh, a spiritization process where, where the sill has reacted with a cell of uh, seawater. So it was probably, as, as I explained in earlier slides, the, the, the sill was intruded into wet sediments below the sediment water interface, but enough, but close enough, and with a lot of hot liquids floating around that, 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 that they're interacting with the, better, with the igneous rock to. to to, to form this sort of 
I guess, metasomatism, really. It's a producing of uh, epidote segregations uh, in early, early on, before, me before metamorphism. And I think what I'm, the point I'm going to finish on in, in a minute with a few slides that get a bit techy, but I'm going to just rush through them quickly, is that uh, these cells are not homogeneous. And many, many of them are, but a lot of them aren't. And if, if you add cumul accumulate textures and differing mineralogies through the cell, and you add the spilletization, sometimes they're spil spilletized and not differentiated. Some they're differentiated and not spilletized. Some have both. So you've got all these sort of end spectrum members of a, of a, of a varying uh, heterogeneous mineralogy in these cells, which will react differently to different fluids and different metamorphic processes. So it gets quite complicated. Um, this is just an example. This, 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 I, Alice has drawn this vertically so you don't get confused with the, with the structure, but here's the phyllite, and there's uh, the exchange of, spillet, of liquids causing the release of the calcium and forming segregations of epidote. He then believes that we actually, later on, this is obviously happening at deposition, this is 600 million years, uh, Greenshield's fat is made relevant, the foliation he thinks is happening obviously in the Grampian or Ogeny 470, or division, uh, and the tilting of the, of the, of the, uh, and the, the, the tilting of the, and the, of the sill into its, its southeast dip, and the development of a, of a, of a basic foli of a foliation with chloride and amphibole. Then you get the exchange of the fluids from the, from the meta sediments here. Some of it comes through the epidote patches and forms sort of a, a dogged sort of line of a metamorphic front, where this is the unaltered, the U is the unaltered sill. These are the epidote segregations. These are the calcium plagioclase uh, uh, phenocrysts that are left, yeah? So we get an infiltration of, uh, of carbon dioxide bearing fluids, which is post-peak metamorphism. And, it's, uh, and the, 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 the epidote segregations cause problems with the metamorphic flow, or they cause uh, barriers and, and, a, and a sort of complicated pathway system. And Alice has taken this a bit further. Um, um, here's some pictures of some, some of these phenocrysts in the, uh, in, the, in the cell. This is a plagioclase that's been replaced by amphibole. And here's an amphibole that's been replaced by chlorite. And he talks about fluid flow in the interior of the cell, just going through the crystals. So it's intergranular. So that the, the, the amphibole, or the plagioclase phenocrysts are being replaced by uh, fluids flowing along the cleavage planes and fracture planes in, in the phenocrysts. Uh, and it's intergranular. In the uh, sill margins, he believes that a lot of the flow is intergranular between the grains. And these are flattened, squashed plagioclase phenocrysts in the sill margins, but replaced by chlorite and calcite, which is not aligned. And so the calcite, the chlorite in the, in the schistosity is aligned, but some of the replacement chlorite in here isn't. And uh, so he believes that a lot of this uh, chlorite, chlorite and the carbonation that's going on is actually post deformation and it's and the flow of fluid in the sill margins is intergranular between the grains yeah so a nice little story that talks about when you took a, just a standard sort of pt diagram and try and summarize it again i borrowed this from alistair's work and his phd students and and and, and ian pitkin as well so we're talking about initially spiritization at relatively low temperatures uh, replacement of the plagioclase, forming of the segregations, the main deformation going on, deformation here, green tree fatty's metamorphism, and then a secondary sort of phase of infiltration of the liquids, the carbon dioxide water liquids, doing the carbonation, then exhumation. And I think some of this stuff actually, when he talked about quartz carbonate sulfide veins, we're talking about possibly even later post or orogenic, even to the carboniferous. So um, the main lead, the main lead stuff in the uh, lead sulfide stuff in Isla is actually carboniferous, which is way past this, but there's a lot of veining. You see a lot of veining, which is, could be quite late. Whew. Right, that's Port Ellen. Uh, we've got one more exposure to see. Um, I know we're running out of time. We're just gonna quickly nick over here to see the last of the GCR sites uh, that's in Jeff's paper. Uh, this is Kilnorton Bay, and I wanted to just show you the kyanide exposure. This is quite a well-known exposure. Um, on the Port Ellen Bay, we're going to finish up our last exposure of the day. We're just going to drive down to here, park the car and walk 100 yards, 50 yards, 50 meters to see this exposure. There's a geological map of, Kil of Kilnorton Bay. Um, this is the route to the Singing Sands here. And there's also some lovely stuff down here, but we're not going to go there today. So we're just staying here at the park here and we just walk out and look at near the lighthouse on the south side of the bay. 
there's a lighthouse, uh, that is my picture, that's a February day. This is the best exposure of the Scarborough conglomerate but, uh, on Isla, but you won't go and see it on a day like this. This is nor would you want to take a ferry into Port Ellen Harbour on a day like this. Uh, but that's a lovely walk on a nice day. There's the, there's the path to the lighthouse through these railings. Um, this is the road to the lighthouse. There's the wee houses at the back of just the lighthouses just off to the left here. And there's some, ex this is Jura Quartzite here. Yeah, this is Jura Slates in a little quarry here. And this is Scarborough Conglomerate. So we're in that sort of lower, we're down lower in the succession than we were earlier. But I wanted to just show you this because it's the, the fourth of the GCR sites on the South Island. I didn't want to sort of end the day without having seen it. Yeah, for those of you who haven't seen it. Because this is Jeff's picture, and this is my picture uh, of these uh, rosettes of kyanite, now replaced by uh, pyrophyllite, I think that's right, yeah, and some kaolinite. But these are kyanite crystals, grow well, they were kyanite, they're pseudomorph now, but they were kyanite crystals growing in these sort of rosettes on, the, on these cleavage surfaces. A lot of, you can see a lot of muscovite as well, it's very shiny. And uh, certainly the, the mineralogy here is that these, this kyanite is totally unusual. You would not expect kyanite, those of you who know you're metamorphic in your barrow zones, but it, you would not expect kyanite in greenish. Green if you've got greenish facies, you're going to not get kyanite. You'd be lucky to get biotite, let alone kyanite. So, um, uh, so what's that doing here? And the belief at the time, certainly the belief is that this particular thin beds of meta mudstone and or better siltstone in the top of the Jura quartz are very high in aluminum. Aluminum? I'm getting American here. Aluminium. And uh, so yeah, um, yeah, high AL, high AL uh, meta, meta siltstones, meta sandstones at the top of the Jura quartz site, allowing uh, an unusual anomalous development of these kyanite blades. Uh, some later work by one of Alistair's PhD students suggests there's a lot of, that, that some of this could have happened at be not to do with the aluminum, it could be to do with a uh, high carbon dioxide uh, metamorphic fluid flow. Um, so he's done a PhD on this as well and suggests that some of this kyanite is actually uh, related to uh, slightly lower temperature. I know the kyanite in the aluminum, aluminium, has been used as a geobarometer, uh, geothermometer, and has taught, and Alistair originally talked about uh, uh, sort of temperatures of about 430, but with the carbon dioxide, it, with the buffering of the carbon dioxide, you can reduce that down to about 350. So it may be a lower temperature carbon, uh, carbon dioxide rich fluid related to the same fluids that metamorphose the sills, and that's post deformation uh, fluid flow that maybe is along with a bit of high aluminium that's, that's caused these kyanite crystals to form. So lovely exposure. Unfortunately, when I wrote about it, somebody came along with a dirty great effing chisel and took it all away. So there is that picture, those two pictures were taken of that place there. And that's just been hacked out. Um, so it's just a problem when you advertise something and you want to explain nice geology to people. Some idiots, they, they were geologically aware people. That's what annoys me so much that they, they read the book, they bought my book, went there, found the exposure and decided to take cart it all away. There's a, I mean, there's some little bits of the, of the exposure left. There's some little bits of rosette stuff around here, but that's, that was the best bit. And there's not much of it. Um, fresh surfaces don't have, you can get some fresh rock and you can get some little white blades on it. But that beautiful uh, uh, sort of weathering of the, of the blades was very visible on that slab. And there's just a few bits and pieces of it left down here. So I thought I'd not show you that because it was sort of a, it's a story of geological conservation gone wrong, as it were. But what can you do? You know, you, you, ad, you advertise these things, you try and sort of tell people about stuff and then idiots go along and wreck it for us. I just want to finish with whiskey because that's how I usually finish my talks with whiskey. Why are these distilleries here? Well, the geology has dictated these whiskey distilleries to be here for two reasons. One is the water and the water for all these three distilleries and the Port Ellen one, which is going to come back into production, all the water comes off the Jura Quartzite it's very soft, it's very acidic, and it's all the same water, basically. Uh, Ardbeg, they put the water through a little laid here into a little thing here, and it's got a lot, it's much dirtier and browner. And it, we've done some analysis of the waters, and a lot of the Ardbeg water is quite high in humus. And we think that the humic, high humic content makes, a, makes for a sweeter or a higher alcohols uh, whiskey in the fermentation process, which may carry through distillation. So. Our bag may be slightly different to the others, which pretty much the same water for everybody. And also, this was a, these 
are the relic distilleries of, the, of an, a massive illegal trade that went on in here because all these little, the geology creates all this beautiful uh, hidden terrains where you could just stash a still in, the, in all those little wooded glens between all the dolerite, metadolerite sills. So the geology has influenced the reason why you could hide a distillery in there. And in fact, it's wooded as well. I believe that some of the original whiskey on Isla wasn't peated, it was charcoaled. It was, they used charcoal because charcoal didn't make so much smoke and you could hide it from the uh, taxmen um, and, the, and, the, uh, and the revenue collectors. So uh, there was a lot of illegal distillery, distillation going on here. Um, and these are the ones that then became legal. And, and that's why we have so many. So people ask, why are there so many? Well, that's the, it, the reason is, and it's to do with geology is part of the reason, shall we say. Yeah? Not the reason, but it's part of the reason. And uh, their water's all pretty similar. Um, there's another story from other distilleries on Ilo about different waters. That's another, another lecture. If you want a whiskey, whiskey and water story, I've got it for you. But this is just a snap of it. Yeah. So, thank you. Time for a dram. They're the three key whiskies. Uh, you can buy me any one of these. I'll go for an odd bag. Thank you very much. In fact, I've got a Port Charlotte here because I've run out of our bag. All my stash from Isla has been drunk. I'm uh, down to my last bottle. So I'm going to just uh, schlange. <laughs> this is a Brook Laddie. David, thank you very much. <clears throat> that was fantastic. Um, and, and that is a great way to, to end a talk like that. Uh, everybody else can go and have another whiskey as well. I'm not going to have a whiskey. Five o'clock in the morning here. <coughs> um, to summarize the virtual field trip, it's uh, to, I haven't been to Isla, which is very bad of me. And uh, I can see many, many reasons for going there. But also what's really good about this, uh, your, your presentation, David, was you've the amount of time you've obviously invested into exploring these localities and uh, not just the localities, the geology, but the history as well, which uh, all together makes for a fantastic presentation. Um, are we allowed to ask questions? Angus, are we allowed to ask questions? Absolutely. Any questions yeah. out there? How does this work? Yes, um, anyone can should be able to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question or they can type on the chat and we can see the questions. Yeah, I'm happy to, 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 to I've got my whiskey in my hand, I'm happy to talk. You know? <laughs> Anybody? I get to ask a question then. Um, <clears throat> You, you didn't concentrate on any uh, on this in your presentation, but uh, the quartz sites um, there, they, and not just the, those quartz sites, but elsewhere on the island, um, has there been any record? They're about of Ediacaran age, aren't they? Some of them. So there's a possibility that, uh, you know, 575 million years or something like that. So there's a possibility of having some uh, fauna in them potentially. An well, well, I guess fauna. I guess a, I guess a paleontologist will always be looking for something. Yeah, I mean, certainly these are pre 600, so they they're built at they're old. The Jura, Jura, all the quartz sites and we see on Isla are all older than 600. So we're talking cryogenian, not. Uh, not Edicarian. Uh, um, no, okay, no, so we're a bit no, old. No, we're a bit older. No, no. Um, there are there are some hints of uh, acrotarchs and some microfossils in the Bonnerhaven Dolomite, which is slightly uh, which is actually slightly older than this than, than the Jura quartzite. So there are some indications of life. Obviously, we've got stromatolites as well. So we've got uh, signs of yeah. biology, uh, significant biology going on. But then you've always pretty much got stromatolites down to three three billion years old these days. I think. Um, but certainly there are microfossils um, in the Bonnerhaven Dolomite. Uh, Ian Fairchild's described them uh, along with Nick Tosca. So they're certainly, uh, they're tiny. Uh, they're microspherules of, uh, that are now being, that are glauconitic, that are now uh, um, fengite, mica. But uh, yeah, there is signs of life, but not in the, the, 
the right. quartzites are not not in, these, the not in these quartzites. No. If if I could drag us back to the topic and away from the paleontology. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was interested in what you were saying about the intrusions being, uh, you thought, quite shallow. Uh, but uh, there, would there be any evidence of interaction with the magma with water at the time of intrusion? Uh, is that there a possibility to pick that out in the edges of the cells, or is that just all too far we, gone? Well, we don't get the same f things that we see in the Tabalics. We don't get the hyaloclastics, we don't get uh, pillow lavas, um, pepperites, anything sort of uh, nasty like that. This, so these doesn't look like any of these sills reached the actual into the water. But they must have been water, they must have been close enough that the, those, you know, circulation cells, I don't know what we're talking about, 50 meters, 100 meters, I'm not sure. Uh, Gulf of California has been sort of, sort of thought of as a pretty much an analogy for this, where the stuff doesn't really get to the surface, but there's certainly uh, igneous activity going on. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some other experts in the society that might know a bit more about, what, about this, but certainly I don't see any evidence in the literature and in the field of uh, sort of sub aerial or submarine volcanism, actually sort of surface volcanism, either under the water or these look like they never reach the surface. Does that answer your question? Mm. Absolutely, yeah. I did as well, a very quick question, which was in um, Alistair's Bay, you had a picture of one of the metabasite cells with heather on it, and that's, I wouldn't have expected heather to grow. Uh, I'd, I'd have expected bracken and grass, in a, in a, and even with the, you know, the calcite content. Um, is that common or is that just... Yeah, they, they, they do seem to be. Yeah, they do. Heather, yeah, I haven't thought about that, but uh, they're not. I mean, certainly you can do a lot of geology on mapping on Isla by looking at vegetation because we've got a, a lot of limestone further north and you can certainly see green fields and pastures when they're not being messed around by modern farming techniques. But yes, you can certainly. I um, mean, yeah, the heather is usually confined to the quartzites and the quartzite hills of Isla are you know, very heathery because uh, they're very acidic soils and you'd have thought the mafix in the sills would have uh, generated a better soil than and richer soil than than that, but yeah, they, there's, you've got a grazing issue as well. You've got a lot of goats as well down there, so it may be that you know by the time you add that factor in, and it, and, it, and it's quite wet as well. Mm. I'll ask the question of my Isla Natural History Society chums whether they uh, whether they know anything about heather on metabasites. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? Do you have a question? question? Fran there? I, I don't think so. I think she, um, there's something else going on in the background. Okay. Right. Oh. <laughs> no, in that case, <laughs> um, if there aren't any other questions. Could, could I ask something a bit different? Uh, David, it, it, it's Bob here. I, I like the style that you've done this in. Have you, have you thought of integrating video into this, or do you think it's just too complicated to do that? Okay, yes, I have. Um, and I was asked when I was doing this, was I going to shoot video? And I guess had I been in Isla and not in Glasgow, I could have gone out and uh, taken a bit of video. Um, I need a decent camera that, with a good wind protector because it's pretty windy Isla and you just get wind noise everywhere or you have to narrate over it. So I have thought about it um, and maybe I'll develop something like that when I get back there and try one with a bit of uh, moving images too. But uh, I thought because, and as my wife had explained it to me, she said because I was writing, going, the, doing this research with the aim of writing a book, I took hundreds of pictures, which you don't often do. If you're just looking at stuff, you might just take the odd picture of the highlight. But I took hundreds of pictures. So, because I wanted to show people in the book, maybe I might need to show them where the gate was or where the fence was or where the, the burn was or things like that. So having lots and lots of pictures and flashing through them quickly is almost like moving images in many respects. And I don't know that moving images would actually add a lot to it. Um, so I've thought about it and I might try it and see what people think but uh, yeah I mean this seems to work for me I mean I mean uh, it's an hour and I got I did a talk for an hour a bit more perhaps you know 70 80 odd slides you can rattle through them 
you know, you some or two, some or two, one or two you have to pause on because there's some techie stuff, and the other times it's just a nice picture and you just move on quickly. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how a video would work. And I'd say I'd need to get a decent camera with a good uh, microphone and wind protection as well. If you just get wind noise, it'd just be awful. Yeah, no, no, no. I think I think what you did is is really good, and it gives the story. And uh, you might get confused, mightn't it? Is I was I promised to do one of these for um, for our local outcrops here on on the Portobello shore, but um, I mean I thought about using a a drone, but I don't think you need it really, do you? You can do it all with stills. Well, the thing is, you're you're taking people on a walk that they would walk so i'm trying to sort of replicate the walk but take a lot of pictures and uh and they're just people can just use their own imagination it's like reading a book you just sort of drift there in your head you know you're just there and uh yeah it might be distracting to try and then and you've also got the techie problem you try and press a button to make the video work and it doesn't go and people can't see it and it jumps around and so it just gives stress to the presenter as well if you've got video clicks to try and make work so it was easy just to do it in a simple powerpoint with pictures but uh I'll I'll go I'll yeah I mean I'll be hopefully be in Isla later next month and uh, we'll have a think about camera I need to go get a better camera I've got a video camera proper video camera but it doesn't have a mic on it so it just has its own mic so I'll need to do something about it anybody else anybody okay I was hoping that people, um, other, other, other geologists in, this, in both societies, and I'm going to show this recording to the uh, Glasgow Society, I may should just give them the recording or I may do it a live one for them as well. Um, but I'm hoping other people will step up to the plate. I mean, it, it, there's a lot, huge potential to do this sort of thing. Uh, people have enjoyed it, not just because of lockdown, but because of uh, they're saying, well, I'm just too old to go there and they just took me there or I live in Panama or Australia and it just took me there. So um, it's the same issue we've got as, a, as societies about our lectures. It's sort, of, it, 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 it's sort of more inclusive to include people in the lectures that couldn't make it into a lecture theatre in, in Edinburgh or Glasgow or couldn't make it to Isla and couldn't walk these routes. And so, you know, it's a it's a ideal opportunity to sort of encourage and improve our outreach activities as 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 societies you know? well i think you certainly shown that it's a format that really really truly works and it's something that i i feel we should try and integrate more into our um into our schedule <coughs> uh, particularly with lectures even regular lectures zooming in so people can even if it was on the in the lecture theatre. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to um, say, I'm the meeting secretary for the society in Glasgow, and I've I, I had I had lined up seven lecturers for our October through to April secret series. I already got it lined up before the outbreak happened, and uh, all bar one are happy to do it on Zoom. And in fact, most of them are delighted to do it on yeah. Zoom. It saves them driving from or travelling from uh, London to Glasgow to do a talk for an hour. Um, in fact, it's easier for them. Yeah. Um, so it, it's something we need to consider, COVID or no COVID, whether it's a way we want to present stuff and share it more as well. As you say, we could do these things across all societies in Scotland. We haven't got any, um, in the near future, any, anything else lined up like this. I wonder if uh, this is a bit ad hoc, whether or not it'd be able to do another online field trip like this before I mean, we have the idea of hopefully restrictions pending getting out possibly later in the autumn to do a little a few little day trips but um until then or even in addition to that whether or not something like this if anybody was up to the challenge bob i mean you just said that you're you're doing something on portobello is it the jopper shore would yes, I, I do the job you, for one. I was, and I, yeah. I think, you know, if we're going to have this big um, geology festival, I think our people are so all around Scotland doing something like this for different places. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ang Angus just put up a little note there saying, or oh, maybe our new president can do one. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do I, it, it did cross my mind, actually, giving uh, some pictures 
of uh, some of the stuff over, that I've seen over here, that, that would have been possible. And maybe, maybe I could do that to complement what we've seen today. Some, uh, some stuff from similar ages, but from the other side of the world. I think um, I mean, that could be arranged re reasonably easily. I mean, it's an, on a reasonably ad hoc basis with a bit of, with a bit of notice to members, aren't it? Um, <laughs> are there uh, are there anything uh, anything else to bring up, Angus? Do you have anything to bring up? Nope, I don't think so. But uh, yeah, I think that's a really good idea to to get a, a South Australia field trip from from you in the next few weeks and uh, set the ball rolling. David's yeah, okay. done a fantastic uh, job over the last few weeks in doing a lot of uh, yeah, virtual field yeah. trips, and there are there are a lot of work, uh, especially the quality that he does. Uh, so it's great that he's been recording them, and uh, they're available on ScottishGeology.com uh, and uh, links through to YouTube. Uh, so it's a fantastic start, but uh, I think it's a, a bit unfair to just just keep on asking him to <laughs> do, do another brilliant one. But I think uh, I, other members of the, our society should uh, uh, should join in. Yes, I've been asked to do, I'm doing one next yeah. week for the uh, Royal Scottish Philosophical Society and there's going to be 350 people listening to uh, me wittering on about Isla. So, uh, um, geology outreach continues. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay then, um, so finally I'd like to thank our speaker um, for a fantastic presentation and uh, it looks like I've <coughs> we'll, we'll be having another one of these shortly, soon in the next few weeks or so, and uh, maybe something can go out, send something out to everybody to let them know. And uh, if there isn't anything else to say, I'd like to thank everybody who's turned up this evening. And uh, I think it's been a good turnout. We had uh, up to, was it 38 people signing in. So that's great. That also shows that these things work. Um, so thank you to everybody who turned up and in that case I'd like to uh, say good morning to everybody or good evening to everyone and sign out. Yeah. Safe close, journey the, close the AGM. Thank you very much. Thanks Dave. Yeah. Thanks Tom. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Guys. Thank Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for all. Thank you. Great stuff, David. Thank you very much. That went really well. And uh, hopefully you got the recording okay. Yeah, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll just stop the recording. I'll close the meeting now and you can get your It'll stop anyway, there, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, absolutely brilliant. See you, I'll see you tomorrow, I think. Yes, Scottish Geology Trust. Acid bath. What was the acid bath thing? It was. F oh, it's just because the forum's dissolving. <laughs> dissolving, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Good analogy. Good yes. Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Bye now. Okay. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Brilliant.